My friends, this is one of those videos I have no idea how I haven't done yet. I've done over a hundred videos and none of them are how to edit guitar. Like I was paid strictly to edit guitar for years. So it's just criminal that I have not done this. Well, better late than never, my friends. And today is the day that I break this down for everyone that asked. And if you didn't ask, well, you're welcome anyways. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. By the end of this video, you'll know all the tips and tricks of what it takes to edit guitars on a pro level. Level. And I'm gonna try really hard to do this in under eight minutes, but if I fail, well, that just means there was too much amazing info to pack into that time span. So, what's happening, fam? Miami here with JST, and I want to know if we can all agree on one thing. A properly edited guitar performance can be the difference between a track sounding huge or sounding like it was done by an amateur. Over editing can lead to a track sounding sterile and boring, and under editing can make a performance sound sloppy and out of sync with the rest of the track. So let's get to the nitty gritty of the proper way to edit modern guitars. Step one, identifying the transient. Let's just start here. If you're editing guitars in 2022, I sure hope that you have a DI track to accompany it. A distorted guitar track is nearly impossible to edit in a modern way without a DI. As we went over in my how to compress a guitar DI video, distortion is compression. So all of your transient information will be non-existent after you run it through an amplifier. So if you're just using a DI, you're going to put an amp sim on the track so you can hear it back distorted while you edit, and if you're using an already amped guitar track with a DI, you're going to want to group the two of those together so when you are editing the DI track, it is also editing the amp track. Now, if you want to do things the pro way, once you edit DI guitars with the real amp track, you're going to want to reamp it. Most likely, there will be some points with which you need to warp or stretch audio that would cause artifacts in the amped guitar but wouldn't show up if you reamped it. This is why a lot of people avoid this headache and have just been using amp sims these days. I'll be using Toneforge Ben Bruce since I've been doing that forever when editing. I've been Ben Bruce, <laughs> I've been Ben Bruce. I've been using Ben Bruce since I've been editing guitars and it'll never go in my recycling bin. So I'll show you an example using a DI on a sim, but if you do it alongside an amp track, just make sure to group them and only edit from the DI track. First pro tip. So let's take a look at our hit points. You've probably done this in the past and noticed that not all of your hit points are being picked up. So I'm going to show you a way to fix this issue. We're going to duplicate the DI track and then cut all of the lows and subs out. If you were expecting a transition there, you're going to have to wait till next episode. I'm trying to transition into a usable guitar track at the moment. So it would seem the way most DAWs are programmed to recognize hit points is that they get confused by the low end information. So removing it makes it easier for the DAW to get the hit points right. Okay, so what I've done here is I've duplicated this guitar track up top and I've added an EQ to what I duplicated. Let's listen to that. Doesn't sound like the greatest DI. But we're gonna apply that effect here to mono. You know, delete the active take that we had. And then going to make this a little easier for us to see by increasing the volume. Now, look at what the hit points are showing for both of these now. Do you see how much more transient information is being picked up that you can pick and deselect just because now all that low end information is out of here? Uh, it makes it way easier for us in, in the future. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to use this through the whole thing, but I just wanted to show you guys that so you know. So that's step one, making sure you've properly identified all of the transient information. Step two, slip editing versus warping. So now comes the dilemma of what type of editor you want to be, a purist or practical. This is also the point at which you might decide to use a specific DAW over another. If I wanted to go the route of slip editing, I'd use Reaper or Cubase to slide the audio around within the region with my mouse. This leaves the track audio completely unaffected and free of any artifacts. I know a bunch of people think Pro Tools can do this, but it can't. You can only do it by a predetermined numerical value of milliseconds, and with Reaper, you can just slide around with your mouse. But anyways, if I wanted to go the warp route, which is honestly fine. I would use Pro Tools because the stretching algorithm works and sounds better than the one in Reaper. So there you go. I said something positive about Pro Tools. Give me some peace of mind for the next year. So let me show you how to start warping. All right. 
So the first thing we're going to do is go into polyphonic mode, and then we're going to go into warp. This will allow us to warp and stretch our audio. And we created our first anchor points. We're gonna do before, after, and then after the last note uh, so that we can move everything around within this time frame. And what you'll see now is as I add these anchors and move them around, it's going to alter the audio before and after the hit point. Not too much is needed. This isn't a terribly recorded guitar track, you know. And that's all this track really needed. You know, a little tightening up here and there. It was played pretty decently, if I do say so myself. The first thing you're going to want to do when warping is to pick a section to edit. It doesn't have to be a crazy chunk, just something that makes sense to you with your current ability. Next, you're going to want to create anchor points. Put one slightly before your first transient and at your last. You'll want to add an extra to the following transient to make it so you can edit the last note. Now anything that you anchor inside these two points will stretch from the point you're pulling, so it often makes sense to make multiple anchor points within your region. Before you start moving things around, try to diagnose what your problem might be. You know, is the guitarist before or after the beat? Could this be resolved by simply moving the section slightly left or right? Or maybe moving around the anchors you realize that a couple points can tighten up the entire performance. This method is extremely useful because I promise you don't want to pull everything to the grid. This results in extremely small and phasey sounding guitars. It's okay to have some points to be anchored to the grid, but you want to make sure if you do that, that you don't have them in the same spots on both sides. This way you continue to avoid any phasing that may occur. Now, the other option is slip editing. Like I said before, the major advantage here is you aren't stretching the audio so you're preserving the quality 100%. You'll want to maintain the same concept as the warping with where the transients are placed. Not too close to each other. What I like to aim for is placing the transients on opposing sides of the grid when I get a chance to while letting some others be random in the same position they were played at. You really want to make sure that nothing sounds jarring to you and it just keeps on going with a smooth progression. The last thing you want to look out for is making sure you're fading the beginning and endings properly. You don't want things to sound like they're being chopped off unless you're specifically looking for that computer gent style thing. I'm sure some of you are. Most people want to have the ending phrase resolve while mitigating the noise that starts before the riff. Let's take a listen to what that sounds like.
Both of these work just fine, to be honest, but I prefer the warp mode in this round, surprisingly. Both can be effective and both have their advantages, but in the end, you need to figure out which one works best for you in the context of your editing. Now, at least when you go to edit next time, you'll have some new tricks up your sleeve to help get you to a pro result. Is there anything else in this area that you would like me to touch on? Which of the two did you prefer after hearing it? Leave it in the comments below and I will chat with my fine friends like I always do. If you're an engineer on the come up, give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe, you only have to do it one time, and tap that bell for notification so when a video drops, you know the location. Until next time, I am out of here. Mic drop, except as engineers we know, I'd never really drop this thing, cause that get really expensive. This isn't actually a shirt this time. I got the Rode NT55, great microphone. Have a great day, later.